Hey everyone, this is Ben Botkin. Uh, today I'm going to be doing a screen capture and a little bit of a breakdown of a piece of music I wrote a few years ago called Commanding the Fleet. Uh, this is a sort of orchestral John Williams-esque adventure track that I wrote as a demo for uh, Soaring Strings by Musical Sampling, which is actually uh, one of my favorite, favorite um, sample libraries of all the ones uh, that I have. And I've never talked about it that much in the video. And um, I never, also never did a screen capture of this piece a few, a few years ago, even though it's one of my favorites and also one of the more popular ones that I've done just based on feedback. So I figured, hey, better late than never. Um, and I also, just, I really wanna talk about this library a little bit, because I think it's, it's something pretty special, even though there's a lot of great string libraries out there. Um, so what I wanna do in this video is play through this piece, talk a little bit about soaring strings in particular, but then also just break down some of the orchestration and instrumentation uh, behind this piece, kind of turn this into something of, um, oh, hopefully this is an educational video, not just in regards to soaring strings, but also uh, some of the um, orchestrational techniques that I'm using uh, as well. So anyway, uh, what I'll do right now is I'll go ahead and select all of the tonal parts, uh, except harp, and I'll open those up in MIDI view. Uh, MIDI roll view. So while it plays through, you can see basically what's going on. I don't like to include uh, percussion in this just because, um, you know, that that sometimes you can't see the chords as clearly because the percussion parts might be all over the place. So you'll be able to hear it, but uh, just visually, you'll just be seeing everything else. So anyway, here goes. This is Commanding the Fleet. So anyways, there is the piece from beginning to end, and that's the, the sound just coming uh, straight out of Cubase, which is my uh, primary DAW. There are a couple things I did to it in, um, in the mixing and mastering stage, added some more reverb, but for the most part, I, I didn't do that much to change this. Also, another thing about this screen capture is I actually... You know, oftentimes when I go back to something old, I try to like clean it up and improve it and use, you know, new, you know, my, my new instruments that I like more than some of my old ones. But for the most part, I just try to keep this one uh, as it was. I cleaned up some, you know, MIDI parts that weren't being used and just so it looks a little bit nicer. But um, 
there's some stuff in here that's actually a little bit different from how I work today because this I actually wrote this piece of music four years ago. So it's I'm learning some interesting things even looking at it because there's some things I do differently today. Like I actually clean up my MIDI parts and performances a little bit more. And um, some of this stuff, as I listen to it, especially as we break it down section by section, I think I'm going to discover like, ooh, this is kind of some sloppy timing. And some of the CC data is a little sloppy, but uh, I'm even learning something from that because when we're creating a piece of music, really the goal is to make a one whole experience that's powerful and lifelike. Uh, you know, especially when we're working with uh, virtual instruments, we want to really it to have that vitality. Well, one thing I like about this piece is that it does have a lot of energy and it feels a little more human than some of my uh, other music. So that's making me think, uh, maybe I am actually tighten, tightening up my MIDI performances a little bit too much today. Maybe I should just be a little bit looser. So anyway, that's just kind of a, an, uh, an overarching thought. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about just briefly what instruments I have going on on this piece. First off, this is a string demo uh, for soaring strings. So all the strings are right up here and uh, that's it. So no, uh, no other libraries. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll circle back around and talk about soaring strings a little bit more in a moment, but I'll just quickly go through what else is here. Uh, woodwinds. Um, we have, this was before the Berlin Woodwinds Revive Library came out. So this is the original Berlin Woodwinds main library, which now is the, I think the 2.2 legacy samples if you have Berlin Woodwinds Revive. So I, I, it's actually not a super, there's actually not a lot of woodwind presence in this piece, but I've got some, uh, this is the Berlin Woodwind Main Library. And then these are some solo instruments. Um, they used to be called the Expansion B, uh, Berlin Woodwind's Expansion B Library. I think now it's called the Soloists One. But these are just some uh, really gorgeous uh, woodwind solos. So that's all I have represented for woodwinds in this piece. Uh, for brass, and again, this is this is just the libraries I was using at the time. I have a few new libraries today that I would be using in addition to or instead of for some of this stuff, but this is just, you know, this is how it was. Um, I was using Arc, uh, Metropolis Arc 1 for uh, some of the brass. Uh, even uh, Hollywood Brass, the six French horns legato patch even makes an entrance, which I haven't used that library in a long time. It kind of makes me think maybe I should go back and just and see what's in there that I'm forgetting. And, you know, if there's any gems I'm really missing, I'm really missing. Um, also some Cinebrass core, trumpet ensemble, um, trombone ensemble. So it's mostly Metropolis Arc 1 and Cinebrass core for the brass. I'm moving down to the choir. All the choir in this piece is Metropolis Arc 1, which is a, it's, it's, it's a, pretty nice high intensity you know full-throated sort of epic choir so that's a that's a great um a great fit for this piece uh percussion i'm using the uh, cineperk timpani for timpani and um almost everything else is from berlin percussion so the reason i'm using the cineperk timpani mostly is because berlin percussion doesn't actually come with the timpani that's a separate product um, I would pro if I had it and I don't have it, I would probably use it over the Cineperk timpani just so it you know sonically fits with everything else. But I mean, this is uh, the Cineperk timpani is great and it's you know it, it works great and works well enough with everything else that I haven't really felt the incentive to go pick up the uh, dedicated um, orchestral tools timpani library. Uh, and then I actually I've got an old VSL. Uh, tubular bells sample, like a, a wooden tubular bells sample, which I, I really love this one. And it's in the part of the contract uh, contact factory library, uh, actually. So that's if you have contact, I believe you've got that as well. And I just that's like my favorite tubular bell sample. Uh, and then Spitfire's harp, there for harp. And so that's what we've got in terms of instruments. Uh, just that's just like a just a ten thousand foot view. But let's go ahead and zoom in and talk about strings a little bit. So Soaring Strings is a specialized string library. You know, the, the intent of it, it was to create a library that captures 
uh, well, soaring strings, soaring, um, melodic, just very rich string, uh, string passages and string parts. So it's it's very agile, it's very fast and easy. Um, it, the legatos are very fast. The vibratos are very uh, very intense, uh, and there's just you know it's uh, it's very expressive. So it's very good for full, lush, fast moving uh, music, and it's. It's got a lot of life to it. Um, it's not intended to be a um, kind of a one one library for everything kind of library. It's all that it comes with is um, violin, viola, celli, and bass legato patches, and then uh, violin, viola, celli, and bass um, sustained patches, and then a couple of and, and there's some soft. Some they're called soft and full, just dynamics are a little different, I guess. And then there's a f uh, couple of full strings patches, but it's basically it's just sustains, and um, it's just sustains and legatos. So it can't do everything, but what it can do, it does really, really well. Now, just a note here: you might notice I have a second violin. That's just uh, there isn't actually a dedicated second violin section that was sampled and recorded for this library. So that's just uh, another instance of um, the violins legato for my for my second violins, just because I, I needed another uh, legato line. But um, so that's that's basically what's included. Now I'm gonna just solo, just strings, and we're gonna I'm gonna go ahead and listen to. Oh, by the way, just a note about the way I like to use folders. Uh, folders are nice for organization, obviously, but I also like to use folders to group sections that I might want to hear in isolation just because it's so easy at least in Cubase to just say I want to hear just the strings solo those strings or I want to hear just the brass or I want to mute just the brass so I like to have these master folders that just kind of captures everything anyways let's go ahead and listen to uh, some of the strings in this piece and I'll do the same thing I'm gonna go ahead and open up just the MIDI. Anyways, you can see the MIDI roll while this goes. Strings only. Okay, so that's just that's just the strings. Something that's interesting looking at this, as you can see, 
Um, you can see the voicing pretty well. And you can see places where like the strings hop out and other instruments hop in. Like here towards the end, the voicing here on the strings is like, it's got some really open gaps where like if I was doing strings on their own, I, I wouldn't do this. Uh, but because we have so many other orchestral elements carrying that weight, you know, filling out those chords, it works okay. And then we even finish here at the end on this, like this open fifths kind of thing. And then the third, the third, which gives us you know, our major minor, that's in the melody. Dun, da, 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 da. Um, so anyway, I'm, um, when I first got this library, um, it was one of the most enjoyable things to actually start playing around with of anything that I've any library that I've ever uh, played with. There's some other ones like uh, Cinematic Studio Strings, which is a great string library and is kind of my main string workhorse for most stuff, just because it's it is kind of more of a um, I, I could do everything kind of main course sort of string library. And there's a lot of great detail in the sound of um, Cinematic Studio Strings, you know CSS, which is really great for um, you know for s slower music. It, it can do a lot of different stuff. Um, but it, it, it took that library took me a while, probably about a couple weeks of working with it before I felt like I'm really getting, I'm getting something from this library that I'm not getting from any other library. Now, as soon as I opened up soaring strings and I started playing around, I mean, it's just so expressive and responsive just right out of the box. It's like, I'm not playing a sample library, I'm playing an instrument. Like I'm playing strings that are alive and that's how it felt. So this this uh, this piece here, <laughs> it was so fun. I, like basically right out of the box, I started writing this cue and it's almost like it wrote itself. Uh, so it, it took me about two days to create, uh, about about 15 hours total, but it was just, um, and there were certain parts like this cello line. Like that cello line sounded so good just playing it in live. I don't think I edited that section hardly at all. And usually I'm editing quite a bit. So even though this right now is not the main string library that I use for most, you know, for most stuff. If I want like instant inspiration, I pull this up because um, it's, it's like, it's like magic. As soon as I open up these patches and I play around. Um, so, and then obviously when I'm doing something that is more in the adventurous genre, more traditional, more uh, agile, more fast moving, just molto vibrato, really high expressive -o stuff. I go, I go right to here just because it does, it's perfect. It's flawless for this stuff. So, uh. One of my um, the tests I would give a string library when I got one is could it play the ET theme? Because that's an interesting that's an interesting test because it's fast moving and agile. It's not like um, a string runs speed, but it's 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 moving quickly and there's some quick turns and stuff. So I, it was so much fun to pull this library up and and realize I can do that and it's convincing. You know, not flawlessly convincing, but uh, great. So something I might do someday, it might be a fun video, is just to try to write a short, really short piece with these strings and just show how easy it is to do some very simple layering. Um, uh, it's, just, it's really fun to write with these. I just, I really love it. And I would use them for everything except um, there's some libraries just that have more of the subtler dynamics a little bit of a different sound. You know, they can just do some other tasks better. 
But the experience of using this library, this is one of my absolute favorite libraries to compose with because it's it's um, it's so inspirational as I'm playing. And it's one of my favorites to work with because it's just it's so simple to get it sounding good at what it does. So anyway, that's just a really short review. But what I should really do is probably just actually I'm gonna I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna turn on my metronome. I'm not going to do something crazy different from what I have here. Oh, I should really open up my automation so you can see my automate volume automation because I actually use volume automation quite a bit um, in controlling in controlling the instruments just because I like the accessibility of it here in Cubase. That's something I should have been showing you while I played it through. Oh well, I'll learn. Um, Okay, let's go. I'll just do something like, make this a little bit louder. And it's going to be in pretty much the same genre. So th th this is not to be original as much as it is just to show you what sort of thing can be done quickly. Okay. All right. Now, I won't do any more than that because then I'll forget what I was doing. And... Let's see. Let's so grab my jelly. Where art thou? I don't even see my jelly. What? I don't see any any uh Chili sustains. Oh, that's okay. I'll, I'll just do this. Use some violas. No, I won't. No, I won't. I'm gonna grab my violas. Viola legato, legato. Let's make that a little bit louder. I'm going to go ahead and finish this, like, like make make a few extra bars. Once I start writing, like I'm unable to speak, like I stop talking. <laughs> it's like my brain can't do all that. just a little bit of 
double bass there just for that final G, just to add a little more weight. Shall I actually taper off a bit? So, like, it's just, it's sounding pretty good. Like, if I just tighten this up a little bit, and, um, yeah. I mean, I'm actually, I might, I might be, this is just like, I'm not even trying very hard here, but if I just met, you know, it's sounding pretty good, isn't it? Like I, and I have done almost nothing. Um, I am going to just clean this up a little bit because, ooh, we don't want that kind of stuff. That just jumps out right at, jumps right out at you. And then, you know, if you just like throw like a flute on there. It's just easy to work with. And it sounds good. And it doesn't work for all genres or all styles, but for what it does, it's incredible. So uh, one of my absolute favorite string libraries, uh, for sure. Another video I wanna do at some point is just one where I talk about my favorite libraries and my favorite patches, like the ones that are the most fun and inspirational to work with. Uh, but that's probably all I should say for soaring strings right now. And I uh, give a few comments to the, uh, some of the other sections as well as uh, make a few comments about um, some of the orchestration things that are going on uh, in this piece. And I, I do really like, one thing I, I like about foldering these off into, into the sections is you can really see what's going on. I like to think when I'm orchestrating, I like to think in terms of sections. So woodwinds wise, uh, there's not a lot happening. I'll play you a couple of these sections just so you can see what the woodwinds are doing, but mostly they're adding just a little bit of color. So um, there's a little bit of melody action here. And then a little bit later, so th this stuff is uh, these uh, Berlin Woodwind Soloist libraries. This alto flute is one of my all-time favorite things, except that it's not making sounds for some reason. Oh, I know what the reason is. Really nice legatos. Really, this is another one of my all-time like favorite patches. Uh, anyway, so the woodwinds are not doing that much. There's one little moment here that is actually one of my favorite moments in the orchestration. Uh, it's kind of a little in-between, little bridge, I guess. We kind of had this big moment, it has to come down. We just had a really full sequence, um, and then it needs to. And then we're gonna have a really big full sequence for the end. So one thing I, I, I like to do sometimes is give a break. And this is only a couple bars of break, but when you can make a break, so you can have just a little more uh, contrast in the dynamics and in the orchestration, uh, it's a good idea. So we go from big to a little bit smaller, and then we just we switch sections for a minute, and we go. Um, you can see no brass right here. No choir right here, very little percussion right here. We got a little bit of harp, some woodwinds, and some soft strings. So let me play you this little in between segment.
And if I open up our tempo track, you can also see that I've got some rubatos penciled in. And that was one of them. So little, little break moments like this, where you switch up your orchestration, you give the listener a pause or a breath or just a change can be really important when it comes to uh, keeping the piece interesting interesting and creating contrast that you know can set you up for your next big section like if you just had another section and there's another there's another place earlier in the piece where I do something similar uh, I have um, near the beginning the voicing is pretty uh, wide across the spectrum you know pr uh, pretty high we go pretty low and we go pretty high um, but then you know, let me open up the MIDI so you can take a look this is more of a like a, an arranging and a voicing thing. Let's, see. Let's get this out of the way. Boom. So we start, and we've got you know some like octaves in the bass. We got some pretty um, you know standard lower voicing like this, and then we just jump to a part where we we jump all high and like there's no bass for a little bit, and that's fine because we want to build back to that. We want to be able to use that low end for uh, weight and gravitas when we really want it. So as we see, we kind of continue to, we, we move our base up real high, and then we slowly start to develop and bring it down as we get bigger and we get more weight. So let's, let's listen to that transition. And the contrast is actually powerful. The contrast of going from low to just high is a little bit, uh, it's a little bit in your face. And so when that choir hits, it's like, it's like a fresh like wave of, uh, of something. So these kinds of contrasts uh, can be really helpful to have in your, in your arranging. So then we just get deeper, deeper, deeper. Uh, and then we've got this, switch to like the the middle section anyway so one thing i like about using bass is you can really use it you know, you, you can use it, um, these really low bass notes to really chomp through or bite through a performance to give it extra weight when you want to have it. So, um, and you can see here when we get to the very end of the piece, you can see there's a lot of, I, I re have the, the low end really well represented in octaves just because it needs to be clear and it needs to be really strong right at the climax of the piece. And then you can see regarding the voicing at the high end, We've got a really wide spread here at the end. We've got really strong bass. We got like an octave down here with double basses, an octave above with celli, I guess, and then an octave above that with French uh, trombones. And then we got our choir, and then we got fairly standard like triadic voicing here for the end. Um, so I'll go ahead and close that up. So just a couple of quick observations about voicing. Uh, woodwinds, uh, I kind of switched gears. We were talking about our woodwinds. Uh, one of my other favorite patches in, um, in, Ber well, in Berlin Woodwinds is the runs transition patches. So these are like, these are great for building runs or fast flourishes. <laughs> And so what I have here is I have kind of these little run gestures, and then I have it doubled an octave above with a piccolo. Now, if you listen to these on their own, they're really sloppy, so just brace yourself.
But that's kind of okay because we're not hearing them in isolation. And in, in, in a real orchestral setting, they would probably be kind of rushed. They might be slightly off the beat. But what they're basically creating is more of an effect. It's more of a gesture or a flourish. So even if it's not 100% on the beat or it's a, li if it's a little sloppy, we're probably going to get more or less the same effect and maybe a stronger effect. Um, it's even possible that it's a stronger effect if it's not too quantized, not too exactly right on the beats. It's, you know, it's a little rushed, a little messy. That's interesting. I, I don't know what I was trying to do rhythmically with that, but it sounds pretty good in context. <laughs> move on and talk about brass briefly. Um, brass ear is, you know, this is a string piece primarily. You know, it's full orchestra, but emphasis on strings. So the brass are here to add, um, to add strength, add weight, add color. Um, they take, it takes the melody in a couple spots, but for the most part, it's, it's uh, a supporting role, which is interesting because brass is uh, so much louder than everything else. Um, so I'll just play a little bit of this section. And this is another one of those things that, looking back four years on, when I isolate this, I'm like, man, I would probably clean this up a lot more now. Trombones. Those are so quiet, they're almost not doing anything. That's not very realistic, you know, in terms of how that how loud that would be in a real orchestra. I like to kill my um, brass players with the repetitions just because, you know, I can. Um, Right here is really the only section where the brass takes the melody. And this is messy. <laughs> That's embarrassing. Um, so with this piece, if I was going to redo it again today, I would probably be using Berlin brass um, because it, it's my main brass workhorse. Um, and but I like I actually really like these uh, trumpet, these tr how these trumpet and trombone repetitions are working. Um, the center brass, it's a really nice sound actually. And it's a little disjointed right next to the Metropolis arc brass, which is like so big. Um, but it works okay. It works okay in context. Uh, moving on my choir, this is all Metropolis arc choir. And this is also very messy stuff that when you hear it on its own, it's just, you can hear, you know, controller code data. That's just not as clean as it's what's going on here you know it's it should really be cleaned up a little more but it adds to the overall effect <laughs> anyways moving on from choir um percussion Again, mostly Berlin percussion. And there's actually a lot of percussion in here. Um, one, of the, one of the great ways to make a piece of music sound really symphonic, like if you want it to be like a really full symphonic kind of adventure cue, use a lot of orchestral percussion. And not just to reinforce the beat or the rhythm, 
And actually, it's usually not for that purpose. Um, it's usually mostly to add effects, to add transition elements, uh, to add accents. So there's some places where we have the percuss percussive elements carrying uh, rhythm. Uh, but most of the time, they're adding flourish. So let's just go ahead and listen to some of the percussion. And also, this is like, I don't know, if you had a real orchestra, what is, you know, would you need four different percussionists, five to do some of this? So, you know, I can, I can go over the top, you know, obviously because it's just me, but um, let's take a list, look at, listen to this in section. You got a little bit of a snare rhythm, the reinforcing with a timpani. It's a little bit, it's supposed to be a little bit march-like. So we've got that reinforcement of that beat. Glockenspiel in octaves on the melody. With some xylophone and harp motion. Kind of to add like a sparkly, shiny effect there for the very end. A little note on uh, Glockenspiel. One thing I like to do in, in uh, pieces like this is when you have a, a melody that you really need to cut through everything else, I like to put Glockenspiel on the melody. And um, just because it is such a piercing sound. Um, it can really... Uh, add definition to the melody and it can cut through the mix a lot better. So like even if it's mostly being carried by like strings and French horns uh, around the middle C area, even if it's that far removed from where the glockenspiel is playing, sometimes just having a glockenspiel doubling it um, can just give it a little bit more crystal clarity and help it cut through that mix. Um, and what else do I have? Harp, Spitfire harp. This is just pretty, pretty basic. Um, you know, um, arpeggios and stuff. So that's, that's pretty much the whole piece. Um, as you can see, there's, you know, there's a lot of different things going on here. Um, and like I said, there's some things to learn from, you know, probably some things to do, maybe some things to not do. Um, but I'm even learning from my four year, you know, my four years younger self and realizing, you know, maybe I don't need to worry about making everything too tight, um, qu like quantizing wise or timing wise when it's for a piece like this, because the overall effect of this is, is actually, I actually really like. So, you know, it's the, the whole quantizing to quantize or not to quantize or how much should you quantize is kind of it's kind of a, a conversation that's on a spectrum because it's there's kind of this subjective sense of what's too tight and mechanical, what's too loose. And I'm realizing I should probably be a little bit looser than I am, but I should also you know right now, but I should probably make if I was going to do this again, I would probably make this a little bit tighter than it is right now, just with the timing of some of these elements. So anyway, that's basically my walkthrough. Uh, please let me know, you know, if you have any comments or thoughts or questions about the video, please just go ahead and, and leave a comment. Also, I should mention, um, you can actually purchase the MIDI file if you're interested. I don't know if you're one of those crazy people who would want to actually buy this, uh, buy the MIDI and, and look through it, but I actually have a MIDI study pack of this piece of music, which and what that includes is, you know, a MIDI file, a tempo track file, so you can see uh, how and why I'm programming my robotos, like they are, and a Cubase project file. So if you're a Cubase user, even if you're if you're not, you can you can still use the MIDI, but you can open up my Cubase project file to see how I'm I'm doing some of this stuff. And there's also an MP3, so you have a, some reference material. But there's also a, a little, like a little PDF study guide with some questions. Um, and some thoughts and some exercises, basically to try to turn uh, this this piece into into a uh, little uh, orchestration lesson. 
So if you're at all interested in looking at that for your own education, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and put a link to that in the, in the um, video description. Also a link to Soaring Strings, because if you like writing music kind of like this, or fantasy, trailer, adventure, symphonic stuff, I mean, it's definitely a library you should know about. And it goes on sale uh, every now and then. So, and uh, sometimes it's, yeah. I mean, I think it's a steal at its regular price, but uh, oftentimes when it hits a sale, I really consider it a no-brainer library just because of how special it is at what it does. So anyway, uh, thanks so much for joining me for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Maybe you took a couple, a couple, um, you know, some information uh, away. I, ho I hope it was helpful for you in some way. But um, I'll go ahead and say goodbye for now. Thanks again for joining me, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thanks so much.